heads up, guys. Mr. Anius, if you check his cut content out, episode 6 is like the end of season 1 cut content. For whatever reason, he doesn't have anything after that. Then season 2 content. So if you guys can find any season 1 cut content that happens after episode 6, or even from the beginning, we can cut, you know, we can cover that too. But this is episode 2 and 3 cut content. Elsa versus Reinhardt was episode uh, 3, right? Let's get it. Last episode, I noticed there was a bit of confusion with regards to what exactly so was this a cut content review or just a recap? <laughs> Is this explanation for ReZero? <laughs> what did change? <laughs> so many people. <laughs> Are you so well, just, just say fuck them and just say I'm gonna make whatever I want. The I'm doing with this series. So, to clarify, the ReZero Cut content series is a summation of everything the anime skipped from the light novel and the manga. Whether it be full cut scenes, missed dialogue or lore and world building, I try to be as detailed as possible. But that also may have been why episode 1 seemed more like a summary than actual new content. I'm so still down. In this episode, I'll focus less on the minor details and try to capture the more major points that were glossed over. Wonder what would have prevented any news from posting beyond episode 6 cut content? Was he getting a bunch of hate from stupid, sweaty, stinky neckbeards saying this is not good enough? Season 2 aired? So he was already slow. By the time he got to episode 6, season 2 was airing. So he said, fuck it, I'm just gonna jump onto season 2 instead. That's unfortunate, but I can understand. Also, in the future, I'll make it clear with what was changed in the director's cut versus the original anime. For this episode, <laughs> in particular... Guys, this is what we're missing out on, by the way. This is the reason why if you don't want to read Zero and director's cut, your experience is ruined, okay? Look at this. Clear with what was changed in the director's ready, cut. Ready? 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 Oh no! Amelia turned her hair there, head there, but director's cut didn't. Now my understanding of ReZero is ruined. I should drop this show right now, bro. I should drop this show. Cam and Dewey, you can see your fucking face tilting, you idiot. Come on now, don't fucking nitpick. Cut versus the original anime. For this episode in particular, there wasn't very much of that, but there was a decent amount of cut content from the epilogue. Okay. So be sure to watch till the end so that you don't miss those important story elements. Now, let's jump right back to where we ended last time, which was after Subaru died for the second time. After being mm -hmm. woken up by the Apple salesman, all the memories of his previous life quickly resurfaced. Memories of the horrible things he experienced only moments ago haunted him down to his very core. He could Not enough to make him realize that this isn't a regression, though. Only think of how great it would be to return to his quiet shell of a life. All he wanted to do right now was simply forget. Seeing Amelia again did help with his confusion, but also quickly went to worsen it when she appeared all tense and defensive around him, eventually leading us right back through the same sequence of events and his inevitable third death at the hands of the thugs he decided to name. What happened here? Larry dumb, 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 and dumber. I think it's like that Larry Joe and so I don't know, I forget. But like, when he died here, did he just walk into the knife? Because it didn't look like anyone really stabbed him. And a knife was just like sticking out of his back when he tried to push through. The same sequence of events and his inevitable third death at the hands of the thugs he decided to name Dumb, Dumber, and Dumbest. While dying for the third time, this was where Subaru began to notice that things were off. You see, up until now, Subaru hadn't yet realized that he'd been restarting every time he died. I mean, he hadn't even realized that he'd been dying yet. He sort of just- How though? Cause it's a shock. Apparently the memories are very hazy. Again, the first iteration, I can totally get it, right? It's a shock, it's a crazy thing happening, who knows, right? Ignored all thoughts relating to it, and tried to completely deny its possibility. But after hearing a very familiar phrase from the Apple salesman one more time, What was the familiar saying? Broke ass kid, can't even buy Appa, get out of here? He started to piece everything together. He decides that a good way to verify his suspicions was to ask for the date. Currently, it was Tammuz the 14th. About halfway through this world's- The what? Tammuz? The four- It's like a month. Obviously not gonna be following like February 14th, it's gonna be Tammuz. About halfway through this world's year. But that didn't June. really mean anything to him since this world likely didn't follow a solar calendar. That information pretty much only served to mark his current point in time. Anyway, all the evidence he needed was already there. Subaru had no choice but to accept that he had the power to revive on death. To him, it was an overpowered ability that would inevitably allow him to find the correct route and win. He that is the thing, right? It's so stupidly powerful, and you would think that the story is going to get boring, but it's not. And like, I'm not sure when it's going to settle in, but he is already getting kind of scared of dying, right? Elsa's 
the encounter with Elsa was very traumatic. So like it's gonna be interesting in how his psyches will maybe even like corrode the more he dies, the more like fear of dying he gets. Because like if if a guy just doesn't care about that and just abuses his power and just like okay this time this happens so I'll learn for next time and just continue to move on. It is the most broken power ever. He wanted to refer to it as a form of time travel, but he knew from manga that that was a concept which was practically impossible to explain or justify. In fact, it's apparently considered an easier feat to recreate the entire world from scratch than go back in time. Really? Oh, okay. But being in a new world meant that nothing was off limits. The rules of his old world could very well no longer apply to this world. So, for all he knew, anything could be possible. Sure. Subaru began to recall his past three lives. He compiled all the information he had and basically came to the conclusion that he should just avoid anywhere he would come across Elsa. He believed she was pretty much the type of character that always meant death when you met her for the first time. And like if we avoided and we didn't avoid, but like what would happen if he decided to just like straight a path of, uh, you know, resolving the conflict at the, at the cellar, right? If we just avoided, would we just live in blissful peace forever? Would the system of this world somehow align destiny so that he gets fucked up in a different way? I don't know. So if he wanted to live, then he figured he should just stay far away from Rom's loot cellar. But while pondering these past events, Splat he tomato. realized that regardless of what he did, there were some things that just wouldn't change. One of which was that Felt and Rom were guaranteed to die if he just let things be. Yep. But would it really even matter if they were gone? I mean... Not really. Like, what the hell does he know about those two, right? I, I think that he has like a good heart though. And I don't know if this is like empathy, or again if this is like pride. I don't know if he genuinely cares about them and cares about Amelia and wants to save them no matter what because he's a good person or if he's just doing it because he thinks that he's like role-playing as some sort of fucking vigilante hero here. They were just criminals after all. It was a perplexing thought that Subaru couldn't so easily come to a conclusion on. If this was back in Japan, then he likely would have done nothing, perhaps even scoffed at their predicament. You see, living a life behind a computer screen left him devoid of compassion and pity. He would read stories of people in similar situations like this all the time. And then he sees like the couple outside, you know, he reads like the manga, the couple, and he sees a couple outside. Like, his way of perceiving reality, I think, is very interesting because, again, he's such a very confident and extroverted guy who I wouldn't expect from such like a casual uh, isekai character archetype where it's just like a shut in neat. So where does that all come from? ...of people in similar situations like this all the time never even giving it a second thought. He felt there was no need to get emotional over things like that, even finding it stupid when other people did. So to him, it really didn't matter if a couple of people he barely knew died. Well, that's how he thought in the old world anyway. In actuality, he despised it. It was much easier to ignore these things back when he wasn't directly involved. But now that he was confronted with a real life situation, those feelings of compassion and pity bore a much heavier weight. It all comes back to Amelia, right? And like how he thought that this girl, no matter what, is going to continue to quote unquote waste her life if she keeps, you know, doing these self-sacrificial things and then continues to justify how it's not for me, it's for them. And like, sorry, it's, it's for me and not for them. And like, that's the point where I'm wondering, like, what is Subaru's like uh, past life like? Because that hasn't really gone into it yet. In Mushoku Tensei, we're in immediately understanding what kind of character Rudy is before resurrecting, right? Right here, I don't really know anything about Subaru. And they're kind of keeping it hidden and maybe when the backstory is shown we'll have to like we'll get to understand more about why he is the way he is but in this moment when he's talking to amelia and like talking and thinking about amelia and saying like i'm gonna save her because like no matter what someone like her is gonna waste the entire life forever is that coming from like a like a perspective of he did that when he was living in his past life right he can empathize because he himself exactly was that kind of person and then he got betrayed or you know and then that's why he became a shutter or something or is he just thinking that he's just hot shit and he can just like decipher everything and he just feels like, oh, I know all these tropes. I know all these cliches because I've read all these mangas and light novels and you're just, you know, he's doing like armchair psychology. This stirred a substantial change in one of his core beliefs, spurring Subaru to act in a much more selfless manner. Now, assuming that this was a timeline where events with Amelia happened exactly the same as the first one, he rushes to the alley where he first met her. Of course, rather than Amelia, he comes across Dumb, Dumber, and Dumbest instead. 
As it would seem, this was one of those unavoidable events. Subaru figured that the three of them had picked him as their target early on, then stalked him until he was alone. It would explain why during his third life, even though he was in a different alley, the thug still managed to corner him. It's like a script. There's these, I don't know how many of these events are unavoidable, but in each iteration of these runs, some events really are unavoidable or some of the things will always be fulfilled. Like, Appa, sorry, the, um, Appa, the, the Appa salesman's daughter, right? We didn't save her this time, but someone else did. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder who did that. Later on, we realized Amelia is the one that actually did that and, st and showed up by the seller. So I'm like, okay, it's, it's kind of like there are these predestined events that must be fulfilled no matter what. Even if the main character strays away from the path, these things will kind of like align. So Subaru would yell out for help, a cry which we saw no one immediately answer. Plan B was to then find an escape route. Sure, he could try to replicate the same scenario from his second life, but he didn't want to risk dying yet again. You see, there was no guarantee that he would get to restart for a fourth time. He remembered a saying about how Buddha only has the patience to save someone three times. That's the scary part, right? We don't know if there's a limit on this, and I think I talked about that in the episode 2 reaction where I say, Okay, this seems busted because he can just continues to abuse it. And the only f only setback is his fear of death and how painful like the mental damage is gonna be. But beyond that, if it's a limitless amount of time, that's fucking crazy. And like, I wonder if they're gonna put some sort of restrictions on it, just like in summertime rendering. Is there some kind of threshold? And if there is, then it'd be very interesting because now we can't just abuse and everyone has to count. But that kind of thing, I don't think will happen until super super late game. You can't just like introduce that kind of mechanic and a regression so early on, or you can't really regress anymore, right? And if that wasn't back to the case, then avoiding death this time should be a top priority. So as he was about to turn and run, that's when Reinhard made his entrance. Giga. He was a man with such a daring demeanor and polished appearance that Subaru felt ashamed to even stand next to him. He thought that this man must have been chosen by God to be the embodiment of perfection. The Reinhardt Glaze is even more insane. <laughs> he's just reading passages from the Night novel. Super sees him. Oh my god, he's been handcrafted by God himself. He is the chosen one. Like, the, the Reinhardt. I love him. I, I sincerely do love Reinhardt. What he did in episode 3 is crazy. But what's even crazier is, like, the respect and, like, the prestige that Reinhardt holds and everyone else's, like, uh, perspective on this guy. So, after he easily scares away the thugs, Reinhardt asks where Subaru was from. Since saying that he was from the Far East didn't work too well with Amelia, Subaru decided to answer that he was from a place so far east that no one had ever seen it before. Mm. Reinhardt could only assume that he was from a place beyond the Grand Cascade. And I what? Whoa, 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 oh hey, it's Dark Amelia, already showing fucking season two footage. I see, I see any news. He assumed that he was from a place beyond the Grand Cascade. Beyond the Grand Cascade. I don't know if Grand Cascade is some sort of fucking border is some sort of i don't know what is that an iconic location that will become more prevalent in season two okay so, right now man season two subaru looks fucking like even in the opening i think this is the face we see well not as not this face maybe but it's a similar face of like sheer anger and like focus because like when i like at the end of episode three Bro was literally fucking humping the air doing dumbass poses being cringe and celebrating and breaking the fourth wall he is having the time of his life. Everything is so easy. Everything is just working out and we get a happy ending. And I'm like, all right, this guy seems to be taking these uh, Isekai adventures pretty casually. So far, everything has gone nice and things have just worked out. And I see a picture like this and I see a bunch of bodies on the ground. <laughs> I wonder what happens. Like how dark and tragic will things get? Because so far, there hasn't really been tragedy. So far, the rock bottom is him just calling Amelia slur in public because he didn't know about the regression part and then, you know, getting just killed by the bandits. You know, that was sad. But I, I really wonder, because like a lot of people are saying, oh, you're not ready for the depression. Oh, the suffering is coming. You have no clue. And it's just like, okay, okay. I, I see that this show is supposed to be kind of like dark and tragic later, but I can totally see it happening if this face is like this later on. Season two. Though, right now, Subaru had no idea what or where the Grand Cascade was. Really, all he could do was nod his head. Then, the rest of the conversation followed as we saw. Subaru then left to go in search of Belt's hideout. But the conversation was interesting because Reinhardt said that there was like, uh, political unrest right now for some foreigner to show up here. 
Reinhardt's about to fucking deport this immigrant. <laughs> I don't know. He was like talking in a very comfortable way to let Subaru kind of open up and maybe get some intel. Maybe he'd like leak something. But Reinhardt seemed a little bit apprehensive at the end when Subaru is walking away after he discloses that like, you know, they're, it, it's, it's, it's um, definitely not during peace times right now. And even at the end of episode 3, as he stares at the moon, he takes felt away. He's like, you know, these peace times are not, not going to last forever. So like crazy succession war kind of thing I think is happening behind the scenes. I don't really know who's even the king or the emperor of the country Lugunicus or even like this capital city. Station followed as we saw. Subaru then left to go in search of Felt's hideout. After questioning four people, he was able to verify its location and confront Felt. Though, instead of getting into a fight like they did in the anime, they get straight to making a deal. But Felt wasn't just going to take Subaru straight to the loot house. Even though Subaru wanted to get the deal done as quickly as possible, Felt was still suspicious of this strange person that she just met. And that became all the more clear when Subaru realized that Felt was walking him in circles. He was well aware that the direction that they were walking didn't oh. quite match up with how he remembered. Plus, he had spotted the same graffiti twice now. Still though, he wasn't entirely sure that she was in fact leading him astray. So calling her out on it was going to be a slight bluff. Fortunately though, it worked. And it led to a change in Felt's attitude when Subaru said that he wasn't upset for being misled. He showed that he understood her situation. And okay. he knew that all he could really do was work towards building a more trusting relationship with her. Whenever there is an angry little brat, just give her head pad and it's corrected. This did get Felt to open up a bit, making Subaru realize that he had the wrong impression on her this entire time. She wasn't just some girl whose life was centered on being greedy. No, that greed was a means to an end that supports a much stronger feeling of determination. Yeah, her entire thing is like, I'm not going to be stuck in poverty here forever. All the other homeless losers here, they're, they're not even trying to get out of poverty. I'm different. I'm going to survive and get out of here and make it. And seeing Felt's resolve firsthand worked to boost his own determination as well. After that, they arrived at Rom's place and got his cell phone appraised. Subaru was about to grab the badge and leave when Felt found it a bit suspicious that he was in such a rush. Her persistence on the topic of his peculiar behavior made Subaru consider other options. Yeah, like, tell her that we have this power. It definitely is suspicious if you're trying to barter and negotiate and you're trying to be fast and be like, Oh, don't worry, you know, the other side can't match what I have. Just take this money and leave. If I was Felt, I wouldn't trust him either. He could wrestle Felt for the badge, but then he'd have to fight Rom as well. Other than that, his only other option was to be honest. You see, he understood why Felt was being so persistent. Her desire to get the best deal was backed by her determination to leave the slums. That's why she refused to let herself or Rom be tricked. So because it had now come to this, it was clear that negotiations had pretty much failed. And to make things worse, Amelia had just arrived at the loot house as well. Bringing us to episode 3, starting life from- that was fucking creepy though, when like, someone was knocking at the door and Felt was going there and we're getting baited thinking it's gonna be Elsa and then it was Amelia, it was like, oh my god, that shit was so tense. From Zero in Another World, covering the rest of Volume 1 of the Light Novel. So, how did Amelia find the loot house so fast? Even under Appa normal Man. circumstances, without any Subaru-based intervention, Lesser it spirits? still should have taken a bit longer. Well, what happened was because Subaru rushed Felt straight from her shack to Rom's place, she wasn't able to hire people to divert Amelia away from the loot cellar. This was a precaution that she would always take, and it's what gave her enough time to get through negotiations with Elsa. But because- There was other people in the slums helping Felt out to, like, prevent Amelia from arriving? Okay. Because that didn't happen and because Subaru wasn't distracting Amelia, she was able to find the loot house much quicker. That's why Felt thought that Subaru was working with Amelia. She couldn't help but feel that she'd been played. So she was ready to just give up the badge and leave. It was actually pretty surprising how easily Felt gave up, as if the slightest disadvantage had made her lose all hope. Regardless, the situation was slowly turning on Subaru. At least that's how it seemed until Elsa- Yeah, everyone is like, you set me up. No, you set me up. And then Elsa was just hiding behind the shadows the entire time. To revealed herself in the shadows. When she began to mock Felt, Subaru was overcome by his own rage. He didn't even understand why, but all these- Oh? <laughs> if only- If only Ananus would say, Subaru was very wrathful in this moment. Overcome with wrath. 
Not pride. Ra I don't know. Like, I'm just trying to, like, in any position, try to relate the seven deadly sins to the, these, like, characters. I even understand why. But all these emotions were just welling up inside of him. Seeing Phelps resolve get trampled over didn't sit too well with him either. Plus, he also carried a bit of a grudge from his last two experiences with her. But more than anything, he was buying time. I'm surprised that he's more mad than scared. Because, like, if Elsa did this shit, like, I'm not sure if I could stand up against her, bro. Like, she is terrifying. But, like, we did encounter her while going to the cellar. And she did scare the shit out of Subaru there, too. And then Elsa said, like, that's not bad, you know? You gotta, if you can hide your hostility, you can be even better. She was, like, coaching us there, too. And for Puck's attack. An unrelenting barrage of ice that looked far superior to any magic that Amelia had cast before. Yeah, it's not fair to compare Puck and Amelia. Like, the power when Puck is not off the 9 to 5 versus when he's off, it's not even the same. Amelia is like, I don't even know what the percentage of strength output is, but Puck is pretty, pretty OP. Unfortunately, Elsa's coat had a formula woven into it that allows it to block a single use of magic directed at it. What is it? There's a formula woven into the robe? Had a formula woven into it that allows it to block a single use of magic directed at it. Interesting. I want to know how the fuck she survived Reinhardt's technique, though. That, I, there, is there something else? Another formula? So she was fine and immediately went to engage Puck. That's a crazy scene, bro. That's a crazy manga scene. What the fuck? <laughs> That's, that's an insane scene, she ain't wearing anything here, bro. Immediately went to engage Puck and Amelia in a 1v2. The thing about this situation, though, was that Elsa was at a complete disadvantage. You see, if multiple magic users are fighting alongside each other, then one just needs to defend while the other preps attacks. Okay. It's a solid strategy that maintains both offense and defense while leaving little to no openings. This was a fact that Rom knew all too well, which is why he was so hesitant to engage Amelia in a fight. He knew the best course of action was to just- Oh, I thought it was because she was a spiritual arch user, that's why he was scared, but it's more of like, oh, there's Puck and Amelia both doing offense and defense, you know, and now it's just seemingly like an unbeatable combo. Just not to fight at all. But with Elsa in the mix now too, he felt he should at least be helping Amelia. Though the fight was just so intense that there wasn't even any room to cut in. The only opening came when Puck froze Elsa's foot giving him time to release what seemed to be his ultimate move. Elsa was only able to dodge by cutting off the sole of her foot. Oh, that's what she did. I thought she just like ripped her foot off the ground. But she just sliced it, huh? And then she closes the wound with the ice again. That is like, it's so raw. And luckily for her, by surviving that attack, she also outlasted Puck. Meaning, now it was time for Rom and Felt to step in. But as we saw, Rom didn't last too long and Subaru had to step in to save Felt. Amelia then took over the fight, while Subaru had to explain to Felt why she had to run. He was also closely monitoring Elsa's movements, noticing that she was becoming ever so sluggish. Clearly, she was expending a lot of energy. So, Subaru waited. He waited for Elsa's back to be completely turned. This would give him the opportunity to strike with Rom's club from a blind spot. And when the moment finally came, had that club been in the hands of a more experienced fighter, it definitely would have worked to take out Elsa. The thing is, Elsa clearly sensed Subaru's intent to kill, and was able to easily react to his amateur attack. Still though, it brought forth enough of an opening for Felt to get away. I am like genuinely impressed at how well Subaru is doing without just like him fighting, the whole fight choreography. When even Felt's leaving, the, way, the fact that he kicked the table up and blocked Elsa's knife, like, Subaru's hand-eye coordination, his overall physical capability is really, really, really good. And, like, I know he does fucking at-home workouts. I understand that he has a grip strength of 70 kilograms and he does a bunch of other shit and he's pretty, like, muscular, but a neat that just stays home and does fucking nothing and just some workouts like that, being able to just like, like have this kind of combat experience and intuition is kind of crazy. Leaving Amelia and Subaru as the only two left to fight. So as the fight goes on, Subaru brings up the topic of Amelia's most powerful ability. She The break in the Odo. Break the Odo and uh, cast, no it's, it's not break, it's a use the Odo, I forget it. Something about the Odo, uh, bring Puck out from the 9 to 5 sleep. And then what happens? Uh, everyone dies apparently except her. It's like final explosion. You mentioned how it was truly only an absolute final option. One that supposedly relied on the power of her parents. 
an aspect that excuse me excuse me truly only an absolute final option yeah one that supposedly relied on the power of her parents her parents i know she sees puck as family but i don't think she sees puck as dad unless puck is dad i don't know their fucking relationship parents though we know nothing about amelia's parents we know about amelia she doesn't even have a surname Everyone else is a family name, she's just Amelia. Absolute final option. One that supposedly relied on the power of her parents. Okay. An aspect that she didn't really like about it. So she preferred- She didn't like that the power related to her parents. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, we'll remember that for whenever Amelia's backstory gets explained. Preferred not to use it at all. But more importantly, it alludes to the potential of her bloodline, hinting at what seems to be a dominant heritage of magic ability. Bloodline. But again, we don't know her family name. She's just a half- Well, if she's a half-elf, what does that mean? It means that- It's half what, though? It's half-elf and then half what? That's the other thing we don't fucking know, right? Because, like, I don't want spoilers, but... For sure, either the mom or the dad is an elf. Probably, like... Is it just as simple as her mom is Satella? Because, like, the comparisons... You know, no, no, no. Satella is a half-elf. That's not possible. They're both half elves. Satella is Emily, Amelia's older sister. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Both could be half elves too. Does that work that way? If hold up, hold up. I would have to get ah oh shit. This is like fucking high school biology fucking uh, genetics class. We're writing fucking x y x x fucking quadrants and looking at you know what happens when different phenotypes are triggered. But like okay, if both mom and dad are halves, then it can be a yes. If if mom is one was half and the other was full, then it would be one eighth or one quarter. Fuck, I don't know, but it could be full non non elf and one elf. Or it could be half elf and half elf. This is getting tricky. Now, given the situation she was currently in, the number of options left available to her were quickly diminishing. She could very well end up having to use that OP power of hers. Do it. And Subaru knew this. So all he could really do to prevent that was put forth his best effort. Normally, he wouldn't have been much of a match for Elsa. But there were three factors in play which made it seem as if he was on equal footing with her. The first was Amelia's support. She was constantly firing ice attacks, causing Elsa to periodically this is true. retreat. The second was Elsa's lack of focus. You see, Elsa couldn't divert her full attention to Subaru. She had to constantly survey her surroundings to make sure that Puck didn't reappear. And finally, Subaru made sure not to put himself within lethal range of Elsa's daggers. Not because he was fighting intelligently, but because he was too scared to fully commit to an attack. The fight wouldn't remain in that state for very long though. Elsa's attacks were unrelenting, and she was slowly but surely gaining the edge. Luckily for Subaru, a pillar of flame would burst straight through the ceiling. As the pillar of flame burst through the ceiling? It just looked like Reinhardt was upstairs and just like dropped in. Flame dissipated, smoke began to fill the room, and from the smoke, a shining figure with a burning aura began to emerge. Akagami! It was Reinhardt. You see, Felt had managed to find help, but more importantly, while she was running away, she was overcome by some unfamiliar emotions. Although she was sad about Rom, she also felt a similar amount of sadness for Subaru. Just by looking at him, really? she knew that he lived a sheltered life. He was someone who wouldn't stand a chance against Elsa. So- <laughs> She was pitying him that much? I mean, yeah, that makes sense. That's- I mean, the age cap isn't even that big either. I thought that she was like, like below 10 years old, but she is like 15. She knew that eventually he was going to die. But why did that thought bother her so much? She only recently- Because of the head pat. That one slice of life head pat moment was enough. ...he met him, so why in her heart does she care so much for his safety? She wasn't sure what made her think this way. But whatever it was, it kept her running until she was able to find help. Little did she know that this very moment would end up changing the fate of the world. Back at the loot cellar- that's a good point. Fate of the world, because like he takes her away at the end. Not because he's a lollycon, not because he plays Blue Archive, but for a separate reason with the insignia's effect on Felt's hand for whatever that was. This is probably like a destined moment, huh? Like literally fate unfolding upon us. Like the first time Felt and Reinhardt meeting. Because like when he takes her away, like I'm sure that's gonna be so important to the plot. It wasn't her stealing the insignia that mattered. 
It was how the insignia was looking on our hands that mattered. ...would end up changing the fate of the world. Back at the loot cellar, Reinhard was fighting Elsa. Though, I don't think that you could even call it a fight. To the eyes of Subaru, every fantastical thing he'd experienced so far in this new world paled in comparison to how extraordinary Reinhardt was. He was quite literally on an unfathomable level of power. Yeah. Even while using a vintage sword that was wasting away. Like, do you know how in Jujutsu Kaisen they immediately introduce Kuna and Gojo fighting? But like, when I'm watching Season 1 for the first time without any context of anyone else and how relative the power scaling is, I'm just witnessing two gods of this anime fight, the one of the strongest beings, without actually appreciating it. I think it's the same thing happening here. Now, maybe Elsa isn't that strong, but I mean Reinhardt. Because like, it's hard to figure out a relative point to like, compare him to, because who the fuck do I know has fought so far? Amelia, Elsa, Ramji? That's about it, right? Reinhardt does seem to be on a different plane of existence. He wasn't even trying. He used a busted blade. His powers were already nerfed because Amelia was already healing Romji. He wasn't even moving and deflecting Elsa's moves. And then one single strike just annihilated her. Now, she survived. I'm not sure how. And I'm kind of happy she survived because, you know, that just means more fan service for us. But I, it, it, it's, it just feels like one of those times where an anime introduces one of the strongest beings in existence early on. And you don't get to see them much later on. Like, this shit happens with, like, what? Even in One Piece, right? Shanks shows up, does his shit, leaves, and you don't really understand or appreciate how strong he really is until you figure out other people that's so strong, you know, glaze people like them. ...away in Rom's loot cellar. It was as if he was able to enhance it and use it to its utmost potential. His techniques seemed to optimize on everything. His movements, his speed, his power... They Bro, were that stomp into kick was so sick. That stomp, that pure stomp and the whole like pressure just emanating off that stomp, bro. That was peak. Optimize on everything. His movements, Boom. his speed, his power, they were all nothing short of perfection. But even with all of that, Elsa wasn't going to go down that easily. She elevated her own abilities to what seemed was godlike. She began to move so quickly that the only thing Subaru could track was the sparks from when their blades collided. The time eventually came for Reinhardt to reveal his true swordsmanship, and when he did, the space around Subaru became distorted. What? Not only was the room beginning to warp, but the temperature also began to drop. What? Amelia felt the need- Temperature drops? Because he's taking all the heat out of the fucking atmosphere and putting it into his sword through this magic attack? I don't even know if this is magic. He just said it's a sword play. It's a sword technique of the Astra family. But no, it, it uses magic, because Amelia was using the ma mana in the atmosphere to heal Rom. So clearly he imbued that sword attack with mana. ...need to lean on Subaru's shoulder. She seemed to have come up with a sudden fever, and her face showed she was in pain and out of breath. Reinhardt's interference with the mana in the room was having a negative effect on Amelia's well-being, huh. thus why she needed Subaru for support. Light began to fill the room until all anyone could see was pure white. Shit like this, anytime you, you see an anime and then you, you start to see all the colors fade away and it's just black and white, you know someone's out to get disintegrated. See was pure white. It felt as if the entire world was shifting. Then, when the light cleared, the distortions in space Subaru had seen were returning themselves back to normal. It was as if his attack had sliced through the very fabric of space. I could believe it. Yeah, I could believe it. Slice through the very fabric of space. Do you think Reinhardt could also time travel with this? I mean, I, I don't think Reinhardt could regress. But you think that he could fucking cut a portal of dimension in air? And then... Fucking travel back to Subaru regressing? I mean, you, you, apparently this guy's a god. I, I could see it. But even something like that wasn't enough to kill Elsa. She emerged from the rubble, then used her knife as a decoy to divert Reinhardt's attention, giving her enough time. That was a decoy? Because to me, it looked like a, it like almost hit him, and then a barrier was there. Used her knife as a decoy to divert Reinhardt's attention, okay. giving her enough time to get away. Everything after this was pretty much spot on. So, we can skip all the way to after Subaru passes out, which brings us- It does look like- if you're gonna mention Gojo right now, this does look like infinite. When that shit just bended as it like approached them, this shit does look like fucking Mugen, bro. After this was pretty much spot on. So, we can skip all the way to after Subaru passes out, which brings us now to the epilogue. Okay. As Reinhardt stared- And I'm surprised at how important the epilogue actually was. I thought that the episode was done and we're gonna have a happy ending, but it's just like, uh-oh. 
Hold up. The drama's not over yet. ...towards the faint blue light given off by the moon, he related its radiance to water magic, the element of healing. He was both tense and worried at the same time, filled with regret as he shouldered all the blame for what had happened to Subaru. Only after Amelia told him that her healing was done was he finally able to let out a sigh of relief. He then immediately apologized for allowing such a thing to happen, kneeling in preparation for any punishment that Amelia was ready to demand of him. It was the most sincere form of apology that any knight could offer, but Amelia wasn't too fond of it. She never understood why knights like him would go so far as to try to take responsibility for every bit of suffering a person experiences. Even though it may not be the most chivalrous, Amelia found Subaru's method of demanding a reward after having saved her to be more appealing. The fuck? Reinhardt got cooked. Subaru outrizzed Reinhardt in Amelia's affection because she thinks that a white knight that takes all the burden is cringe. But <laughs> fat ugly bastard trying to reap the rewards of his isekai journey is good. <laughs> no, I don't know. That's, that's very interesting uh, mentality perspective from Amelia there. O okay. So, she found it frustrating that Reinhardt would want to be punished even though he had saved everyone. And with the way she phrased this, Reinhardt couldn't help but feel like he was being belittled. She- It does feel that way now. She was pretty dismissive as soon as Reinhardt was like, Are you okay to Amelia? And Amelia was like, Get the fuck out of my way. Subaru is more important right now. And I didn't think much after that, but like, now Annie is telling me the inner psyches of what's going on. That's, that's very interesting for Amelia. She spoke in such a grand manner that he could only assume it was because she was one of the chosen ones. That what? being the case, her safety was also a- One of the chosen ones? One of the chosen ones. Does this go back with the insignia? She spoke in such a grand manner that he could only assume it was because she was one of the chosen ones. If the chosen one entails the relationship with the insignia, does that not mean Reinhardt found a chosen one within Felt? That's gotta be the only other reason, right? Because it's not Reinhardt thinking Felt stole the insignia that mattered, it's the way that the insignia looked that mattered. And if the insignia chooses somebody, does that not mean Felt is also a chosen one then? That being the case, her safety was also a priority. So Reinhardt insisted that he have his knights escort her home. Okay. Considering everything that had happened, Amelia felt that that would be the safest option as well. Now with nothing else to talk about, Reinhardt examines what was once the loot cellar, a building that he pretty much ruined on his own. The th you better fucking pay for this shit, bro. Thing is, all this damage was because he was unable to control his own power. He made a slight miscalculation and that resulted in the whole loot cellar being cut right in half. Oh! So, he is this godlike figure, but even he can't control his power. Being so powerful that you can't even control your own power, yeah. I mean, that's kind of like... Amateur. But, understanding how strong he is, it's probably more like a feat that he is such a powerful being that he, even Reinhardt himself, can't even control his powers. Had he miscalculated by even more, then the whole slum block would have been leveled. <laughs> that's just the type of power that Reinhardt was dealing with and he knew that he had to be more careful next time. Okay. Amelia then went over to talk to Felt, and while they were trying to make things right between them, Felt declared that she had zero intention of turning over a new leaf. Thievery was part of her life, it's how she got by, and she had no plans on stopping that. It was a difficult sentiment for Amelia to accept, but- But it's like, what are you gonna do? Okay, Amelia, out of your white knight, not, not even the white knight, but out of your like pure justice, you tell Felt that you need to, you know, live a better life, but it's like, it's not that simple. That's basically going up to a homeless person and saying, get, just get a job. Just fucking have a house. You can't tell people that's stuck in this system that have their one way of surviving and say that you can't do that anymore. Unless you're going to offer that support and infrastructure, then sure, then you can expect, you know, Felt to live a better life. But it's like, if you're not going to offer anything of assistance, you can't just like moral grandstand this girl and say you can't steal anymore to live. It's just like, that's not going to work. She understood that this was the hand Felt was given. Here was this 15-year-old girl doing everything she could to get by. So who was she to judge her way of life? Similarly, Reinhardt also felt pity. Even though it was his duty as a knight to prevent those crimes, he could only look on in silence. How could he rebuke Felt's way of life without providing a proper alternative? The capital was an unforgiving place, and- It's easy! 
Reinhardt take Felt, right? I mean, we got taken by Amelia, and then Felt is not going to go to Reinhardt, and now Felt can live in the Austria family dormitories. I don't know. Reinhardt knew that Felt wouldn't be able to survive there. Because of that, he was willing to let her be. But that all changed when she pulled out the insignia. Mm -hmm. It was only for a brief moment, but what he saw was a familiar flash of a red cross. Okay, red cross? I was looking at the gemstone in the middle. A red cross? Reinhardt sifted through his memories until finally finding the one that he wanted. Then with a grip that can bend steel, he grabbed Felt by the wrist and insisted that she go with him. Of course she was reluctant, so Reinhardt was forced to render her unconscious by draining the power from her body. Likely in <laughs> He drained the power from her body. It just looked like some kind of force attack and he knocked her out, but he... This act is just draining someone's power, okay? ...from her body. Likely in a similar manner to when he affected Amelia by absorbing all the nearby men. Ah, oh, okay, now, okay, okay. when the badge was returned, on it could be seen a dragon that represented the state symbol of the dragon friend kingdom of Lagunica. Got it! So it's not a gold bat, right? We were looking for like, what does that insignia look like? It just looks like a gold bat, a fucking bat's mouth wide open, but it's more like a dragon. And there was mentions of a dragon multiple times where? Uh, I think the secret code name. <laughs> When Felt was knocking on Ramji's door, and like the code was like, you know, the noble dragon sees us as shitbags or something. What other, uh, well, there's a mention of a dragon claw marks on like, you know, Reinhardt's sword. And I'm just assuming that he slays some sort of dragon to become like a sword saint, but then apparently he was born as a sword saint, so maybe that's not the case. I don't know. I don't know, but Dragon Kingdom of Lugunika, huh? Dragon Kingdom. Now, when the badge was returned, on it could be seen a dragon that represented yeah. the state symbol of the dragon friend kingdom of Lagunica. State symbol, dragon kingdom of Lagunica. Meaning there is someone associated with, like, whoever rules this place is, like, has some association with dragon. If the kingdom's lore, if the kingdom's, like, symbol is a dragon, then, like, what is this, some fucking house Targaryen shit from, like, Game of Thrones? Symbol of the dragon friend kingdom of Lagunica. While in Reinhardt's hands, the red jewel in the center only gave off a dull glow. But what? There it is. I was looking for any single point where the insignia might have looked different than other people's hands in episode 3 reaction by the end. But I couldn't find any single point. The Rumji held it for a bit, but it was so far off in the distance I couldn't tell. But if that glow is the thing that matters, then it must be as simple as you are a chosen one if the insignia responds to you with that glow. That's why Reinhardt saw the insignia in Feltan, saw the glow and said, no, this is fucking important. How old are you and what's your family? She had no family and she's like 15, right? So I don't know exactly what criteria or conditions he was looking for there, but clearly he found another chosen one at this moment, right? If it has to do with the glow and how Reinhardt sees Emilia as the chosen one, right? Only gave off a dull glow. But when passed off to Amelia, it began to shine bright, as if it knew it was in the hands of someone who was its rightful owner. Chosen that one? was the indication that Reinhardt needed to act, setting much larger things into motion. And then what does it mean to be a chosen one? I mean, there's political unrest going on, and I, I can only imagine some sort of succession war. But I thought it would be with like the crown princes and princesses of whatever, you know, ruling family there is here. But maybe the chosen ones could have to do with like that succession war itself. I don't know. We need to watch more of the anime to understand like what other factions and family do exist that's backing everybody. And with that, we end episode three. Hopefully this time I didn't go too overboard with the details. I mean, go I'd more. love to know if you think that I should keep trimming it down or maintain this level of detail. Motherfucker, this shit needs to be longer. And I'm so sad that he dropped this off of after episode six. But hey, it is what it is. Please go check out Mr. Any News. Go to his channel. Sub, like the video if you did. And I will see you on the next ReZero content.